Hello? 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 How you feeling today? Yeah? Got a little something? Weather changes. It seemed like the, wa the warmer weather would be better, and then it was cold, and then it got warm. Uh, is this supposed to be on, Mickey? Yeah. Hello? It's, uh, you can hear it out there? Hello? Oh, it's just not on in here. Okay, well, we are, I don't know, are we online up there, Eric? We are online. Um, let's see what prayer requests we have today. One for technology to work. Um, because Travis can't be here. Okay, other, any I'm glad to see Joe and Melissa here today. Um, so I hope that's a sign that you're finding things out. Well, we're going. I spent, we were gone nine hours Thursday to the doctors. <laughs> Oh boy. <laughs> Very long appointments. Um, but uh, they kind of ruled out one thing completely. So we're down to just a couple of possibilities, and the doctor wants me to get off the steroid bed. That's where we're moving this direction right now. Okay. Well, ruling out something is better than wondering if it's still there. Right. Okay. All right, any other prayer requests? I have a son that is flying back from Germany today, and he is probably somewhere over the Atlantic right now. Um, he sometimes, <laughs> because of who he is, Bill always buys internet when he's traveling in the airplane. Um, and at least he gets texting. So he texted his, his itinerary. And Anyway, I want to pray for my son, Bill. Okay, um, Earl first and then Mike. Civilian contractor. He is a civilian contractor. He's not a member of the military. No. No, he's not a military member of the military. He is a civilian contractor. He's not carrying a gun either. It's all internet stuff that Bill does. Okay, Mike, you had one. I have a son that's going to England, so he's going to Europe tomorrow. <laughs> okay. So you've got ben. sons sons that are traveling. Ben is uh, going. Uh, so the the youth. Uh, Ms. De Youth is they last year they went to Israel. This year, they're going to England and and some other places. And if you've heard of Adam Ramden, he is, he produces Lineage. It's a really I mean if you haven't heard of Lineage videos, they're really good. Um, they tell you history of of uh, the church and the reformation and our church and such and so it's okay. it's it's really they're they're short five or ten minute videos and um so adam ramden is is uh he knows my brother and they've talked and they basically they've produced be able to do a trip that's going to do a lot of history and adam's going to lead out in it and he's going to take them and and uh, go to a different place so the there's a lot of youth um in our conference that are going to that and um 
one of them is Ben. So. Okay. Well, good. Good. Any so other? just say, yeah, safe travels for everybody. That's. Now, so he's going to Europe. To he England. is. He's going to England. Yeah. Wow. Okay. How many of you have been to England? I know. I'm jealous. <laughs> I was like, come on. But they, the, the so for pathfinders um so like when evan gets to be a fourth year tlt they they get to go they sponsor all fourth year tlts they have to pay for their flights but other than that they sponsor them to go on these trips so last year all four year tlts got to go for free except for their flight and so th each year they're doing this to to give you know an experience for our youth and and particularly the TLTs as well. Now is that sponsored by Michigan Conference or yeah. by Lake Union? It's a conference. Okay, very good. Yeah. Okay, other requests or prayer or praises, I should say. I hear that Kimberly's boss is uh, sick and in the hospital, so she'll have more stuff to do than usual now. The Timber Ridge Camp, Indiana? Pardon? Kimberly, Kimberly's boss is... Oh, Kimberly's boss. Yeah. Okay, I was hearing Timber Ridge Camp. And that's camp in Indiana. So, okay, Kimberly's boss is sick, and now she's going to have more to do. Okay, that's my, my boss is gone, <laughs> the pastor, and certain things have been put on me to do. So, Mike, we have to talk because I've got to come to the conference office with something. Okay. Uh, technology, and I'll need your support okay. <laughs> to get that done. Okay, others. Okay, if not, I'm going to take up time with other things, but let's uh, let's go ahead and have prayer, and then let's get into our lesson. And I'm going to need help today, so make sure you've got uh, relaxed enough that you're not going to be afraid to talk and, and help me figure things out here today. So let's, let's begin with prayer here. Father, I pray that you will bless us as we spend time in your word looking at the book of Psalms. And I pray that you will help us to have clear minds where we can apply what we learn to, uh, to our everyday life. We've mentioned several requests. You've heard them. And you know the ones that we've got in our heart that... Uh, we have not voiced out loud, but uh, we're glad that Joe and Melissa are here, and we do pray for their continued healing. And again, please bless us as we study. I ask in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Okay, Longing for God in Zion is the title, and... Um, we kind of, did, did you notice the lesson kind of hopped around a little bit today is when it came to Zion? Did any of you, let me, so that I can get where we're at here, um, anybody watch Talking Points this week? Okay. I didn't quite finish it, but I, I felt it was pretty good. Um, Hope Sabbath School? Anybody watch Hope Sabbath School? Anybody watch the It Is Written? Okay, Mike did that. I found that one to be the most helpful. The, the one who wrote the lesson herself really gave me some good pointers on how to approach this lesson today. Um, our memory verse. And would somebody read that out loud for us? It's on the screen or it's in your quarterly. Okay, Mike, you've got the mic. All right. Oh, yeah. 
by default. My soul longs, yes, even faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Psalms 84, 2. Okay. Here is the question. What is or who is Zion? If you watch Talking Points, and two of you did, uh, Mark laid out six different ideas for Zion, according to Scripture, of what Zion is. Because we're talking about looking for God in Zion. What is Zion? And uh, I wanted to go over these six things fairly quickly. And uh, I think... I think it it might just confuse us a little more, except I put a star by the ones that I think are the most important. And you'll see that as we go along here. Um, somebody look up 2 Chronicles 5, verse 2. And, um, and we'll, we'll see how Zion is used there. Second Chronicles chapter 5 and verse 2. And let's not be shy, please. It's just a few of us here and a hundred million can be watching on streaming if they wanted to. Uh, we'll probably have maybe one or two. Did the Whitakers watch our streaming last week? You couldn't get through? Oh, you were in the hospital. Yeah, okay. Okay. But we're trying to uh, live stream Sabbath school as well now. Um, and not many will be watching. Um, but let's get in the habit. Okay. Second Chronicles 5, verse 2. And if you don't read this one, I'm going to start a calling on you to start reading because we got, okay. Earl will read it. The chief fathers of the children of Israel in Jerusalem, that they might bring the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord up from the city of David, which is Zion. Okay, Zion then is a city that is called David. Okay, Psalm 2 and verse 6. Okay, Psalm 2 and verse 6. I'll give you a break. I know you're really getting tired of reading, and so I'll read this one. I have installed my king on Zion, my holy mountain. So there's a mountain that's called Zion too. And then uh, Psalm 48, verses 1 and 2, and this, I think this one was in our lesson Psalm 48, verses 1 and 2. I'll read that. Okay, uh, Mike. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. In the city of our God is his holy mountain. Beautiful in elevation, the joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion on the sides of the north, the city of the great king. Okay, so we could say that uh, one of these was the city where, where God's throne is situated. And this one almost deserved a star, but some of the others are a little, little more clear. Psalm 76 and verse 2. And I put a star on this one because I think this one is very important when it comes to discovering uh, what Zion is. Psalm 76, 2. And the next two after this kind of uh, echo this a bit. So they're almost the same thing. I think if I were Mark, I would have, I would have uh, maybe lumped some of these together. 
Psalm 76, 2. Okay, Joe. Psalm 76, 2, and this version says, And his abode is in Salem, and his lair in Zion. Okay. Um, mine says his dwelling, his dwelling place in Zion. So where God's dwelling place. And I thought, okay, that's, that's, a, that's worth a good star. The next one is worth a star, too, um, where God's people dwell. And this time we're looking at Isaiah chapter 10 and verse 24. Since we're out of Psalms, I'll go ahead and read there, this one. Therefore, this is what the Lord, the Lord Almighty says. My people who live in Zion, do not be afraid of the Assyrians who beat you with the rod and so forth there. And then in verse 12, chapter 12, 6, it says, Shout aloud and sing for joy, people of Zion. So it's where God's people dwell. Hmm. Does that mean this church could be Zion? Just keep that as a thought. Okay, and now let's make it really clear. This time I want us to go to uh, Isaiah 40. In verse 9, God's church is kind of called Zion. Psalm 40, verse 9. I'll read that. O Zion... You who bring good tidings, get up into the high mountain, O Jerusalem. You who bring good tidings, lift up your voice with strength. Lift it up, be not afraid. Say to the cities of Judah, behold your God. Okay, so we're looking at, at God's church. Now, you can, th these were ones that Mark Howard had put out. But I want to look at ge geographically where Zion was. We had Mount Zion, and uh, according to um, Hope Sabbath School, th the elevation there is about 2,500 feet above sea level. Uh, Mike, you've been there, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, about 2,500 feet above sea level, which is, which is enough for those of us here in Michigan to take note of, uh, where we were on vacation, it was right at 2,000 feet. And we were, you know, driving up and down mountains in North Carolina. <laughs> They've got a lot of mountains there. And um, I could tell it was affecting me. Now, particularly notice that north is not pointed straight up. They have done this in more of a landscape format, so they put north going off to the right. And we've got Mount Moriah uh, down south of that, but it's not really south of that. It's actually a little bit north of that. And these hills kind of merge together, Mike. Uh, is that right? You've, you've, you've been there on that. Mount Moriah, um, well, let's come back to our, the woman who wrote these lessons um, last, yesterday morning when I was watching what she had to say. She said there are scholars who try to say Mount Zion takes over the whole area, including Mount Moriah and, and all of that. And if you watched Hope Sabbath School, you would, uh, you would agree with that because the way he approached Mount Moriah, it was similar to the way he would approach Mount Zion. So we're looking at kind of the whole package of being... Uh, Mount Zion, or being Zion without calling it Mount Zion, it becomes kind of the whole territory. Um, you don't have to agree with that, uh, because I couldn't find any scripture that put it that way, other than what Mark Howard had put together when it talks about the church, the place where God's at, and all of that. I've always looked at Mount Moriah differently. Uh, Mount Moriah is the place where 
Abraham was supposed to sacrifice his son, and God stopped it. You remember, God said, uh, you know, don't do that, Abram, Abraham. Uh, also, Mount Moriah, I believe, is where David stopped, the Lord stopped the destroying angel, and David bought this place, um, and we got that in, in Samuel, where David said, uh, the, the man, uh, David had did, did the census, you remember that story? David called for a census of all the fighting men. God said, you shouldn't do that. And even Joab, his army man, said, you shouldn't do that. And God started punishing Israel for that. And it was stopped right at Mount Moriah, if I've got my story right. And he wanted to make a sacrifice. And the man who owned it said, here, I'll give it to you for a sacrifice. And I love what David said. David said, I will not sacrifice something to the Lord that didn't cost me something. Isn't that neat? He just said, if it didn't cost me anything, it's not a sacrifice. So he bought the land, and then this is where the temple was built. So we've got those three stories. Am I right on those three stories? Nobody's arguing with me. You can go home and find out if I'm right or not. Anyway, we've got those three stories. Now, the title of the lesson is what? Searching for the God in Zion? Looking for? How to... Okay, Mike. Mount Moriah is also, you know, the Temple Mount is what they call it, you know, yeah. t t today's. And it also is right next, you know, uh, Golgotha is right there. So where Abraham was going to sacrifice his son, that is the same place where God sacrificed his son. Um, yeah. Uh, so that was really special connection that I thought was really neat when you think about the same place where Abraham <laughs> was, and the Lord said, "No, don't do that. Um, I know you know you you are willing, and and uh, your faith is is you know where it needs to be." And and he, so it just it was so amazing to to think that that was the same exact area where the same mountain where yeah. where uh, a precursor of what Christ would do for His sacrifice. Yeah. Okay, very good. Now, there are, and, and this wasn't touched very much in the lesson, and I had to go look to make sure you're not going to cover this in the next couple of lessons, but we've got the Psalms of Ascent, and those are Psalms 120 through 134. And that's kind of a separate, a, a separate, um, what would you call it, hymnal of different hymns that they sang when they were on their way to, um, to Jerusalem for these three different feasts. They were told to go to Jerusalem. The only thing that I can come up with in my thinking is that... Uh, these three hymns, I mean, three feasts, are kind of like camp meeting to me. Okay, good. Melissa's agreeing with me. Good. Um, it's kind of like going to camp meeting. And when you're going to camp meeting, if you've got little kids with you, you start singing songs that you're going to sing when you get to camp meeting. And that's what they were do when they would, and, and they had to kind of go up to you know, from, from different areas, they had to grow, go up. And I thought, we should sing a song about going to Zion. What do you think? Should we sing, we're marching to Zion? Anybody willing to sing that with me if I can produce some music? Uh, and if everything works right, I will. And then let's sing three verses, verses 1, 2, and 4. And it's in your hymnal 422, if you don't want to see it on the screen or if I don't get back up here in time to, to do it. And, and Mike, would you go lead it? And, well, that way I can keep it going back here.
Many times our hymns, uh, we sing them, you know, almost in the same uh, speed. But this, this uh, not that we need to go really fast, but this is a song where, you know, at least for me, when I think about singing it, it's a, it, it's a happy song. So it's not a, we're marching. Well, that may be how it's we uh, got it today. Yeah. So let's, let's see what we've got. <laughs> but you know what I'm saying? Like, I'm sure when they were walking, it wasn't like they were, uh, we're drudging to Zion. Come we that love the Lord and let our joys be known. Join in a song with sweet accord. Join in a song with sweet accord. Thus surround the throne and thus surround the throne. We're marching to Zion. Beautiful, beautiful Zion. We're marching upward to Zion. Zion, that beautiful city of God. Let those refuse to sing who never knew our God. But children of the heavenly King, but children of the heavenly King may speak their joys abroad, may speak their joys abroad. We're marching to Zion. Beautiful, beautiful Zion, we're marching upward to heaven, Zion, that beautiful city of God. Then let our songs abound and every tear be dry. We're marching through Emmanuel's ground. We're marching through Emmanuel's ground to favor worlds on high, to favor worlds on high. We're marching to Zion, beautiful, beautiful Zion. We're marching up to heaven, Zion, that beautiful city of God. Choir practices immediately after our church service today. <laughs> okay, I just thought it was appropriate to sing that song today. And uh, I had Lynn play the music for us so we could do that. Okay, we've got a lot more Bible reading to do here. And I'm, I really appreciated when... Uh, Lisa taught that lesson where she said, I try to put myself in the place of the Bible stories. I don't know why I had never thought that concept through, but I think today not only do we try to put ourselves in that place, we should also try to put ourselves in this place. So somebody, if you would, let's take a look at Psalm 84, and I need someone to read for us verses 1 through 4. So if you don't read now, you're going to read later. So go ahead and, and look that up there. Psalm 84, verses 1 through 4. Who has that? Okay, good. Casey has it. How amiable are thy tabernacles, O Lord of hosts! My soul longeth, yea, even fainteth for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh crieth out for the living God. Yea, the sparrow hath found a house, the swallow a nest for herself, where she may lay her young, even thine altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. Blessed are they that dwell in the house. They will be still praising thee. Bella. Okay, let's go back as far as we can understand history. As far as we can understand history, picture, again, we're putting ourselves in their place, right? 
we're going up to Jerusalem for one of these three feasts, either the Passover, uh, Pentecost, or the Feast of Booths. Um, we're going up for one of those one of those fun things, and as we are going up there, we're singing songs. Why are they singing these songs? What kind of conditions are the children of Israel in right now? And welcome. Okay, Keith. What? Keeping their children entertained. You know, Keith, I could have gone a long time without that one. Uh, but there, there may be a lot of truth to it. Uh, because when you are on a, on a journey and, and driving, you've got you to gotta keep the kids from fighting. They're on my side of the seat. Any of you ever had that argument with your kids? He's, he's on my part, and, and uh, he won't let me look out the window, and he won't trade places with me. I'm saying he because we had three boys. Okay, Keith, I'll give you that one. But that's not the important one. What's some of the other reasons they had to be glad to go to Jerusalem? Okay, they loved God. Okay. What were the conditions politically during this period of time? And we're talking about the New Testament time. I, I am anyway. Okay. Okay, but Jesus was born there, and they were wanting to find the Messiah, uh, although that wasn't, they didn't really know Jesus at that time. Were they politically in charge of their own nation? No, they, they really weren't at this point, um, Malinka. They, uh, they, they were not. They were in basically a foreign country part of the time. Now, when these Psalms were written, they may have been written during the time of David. And if that was the case, you were right. They would be in charge of their own kingdom. But if as time went on, they were not in charge of their own kingdom. And so it was politically not the best of times. So you would do a lot of singing of praising God and those kinds of things. Anybody else got a comment on that? Earl? Okay, say that again so that I understand it. Wait a minute, let's get you a mic so that people online will be able to hear you. Nowadays in Israel, they think Zionism is a political event along with religious. Okay, probably more political than religious, I would think. Yeah, yeah. And, but there is a, a religious connotation to that. And that kind of brings us to it, to here. Even no matter how bad things were with them, they could still sing songs of praise to God. True or false? Even when things are bad, they found reasons to sing. Hmm, that's just the thought here. And then the second part of the question brings this to today. Are conditions today any better than the conditions were when these hymns were written? In other words, do we have political turmoil today? And do we have hatred on both sides for the other side? It, it appears to me I don't know if I can use the word hatred, but I could use very strong opinions and very little ideas of working together to try to bring something together. I think, I don't remember who gets the credit for this, 
I thought it was Mark Twain, but it may not have been. It would be surprising the amount of work that could be done if it didn't matter who got the credit. What do you think? It would be surprising the amount of work that could be done if it didn't matter who got the credit. And so we've got some of those same kind of issues, and so we should be finding time to, um, to sing to the Lord even when things are not going as good as we'd hoped they would be. Any more comments on this? Okay, in your quarterly, go to Sunday's lesson, and I quoted this particular part of the note. It's, it's a second note about in the middle of, the, uh, middle of that paragraph. It says, The living presence of God in the sanctuary gives the worshipers a glimpse of God's glorious kingdom and a taste of eternal life. Do you feel that way about coming to church? Why not? More than it being about worshiping God. So that's been my experience. Okay. I, I have to tell you that when we were, I don't know whether to call it vacation or not when it's almost two months, I wanted to be here. And they had to practically drag me to go to another church because I wanted to be here in this place. Okay. <laughs> and I missed you. I missed the fellowship. And... I've got a different experience than Allison has because to me, I just had to be here. And they drug me off to the other church. I, I said, I got to stay here with the dog. This is a new house, and I don't want to put her in a crate for three hours, you know, two hours or whatever. And so I'll stay with the dog and I'll come to Charlotte for church. And I got to be honest with you, I on my laptop here, I was in Charlotte, but on my iPad, I was at their church so I could know when they were coming home to turn the oven on and stuff like that. They had left me a list to do. But I wanted to be here. And like I said, they, they did get me to the other church a couple of times, and one of them stayed home with the dog. If Allison's comments are accurate, what can we do about it? How can we make this place a place where Jesus is? Okay, we can love each other. I'm going to cover this a little bit more, Belenka. Show kindness. Okay, let's get somebody else back there. I'll come back to you. Anybody else back there? Okay. Okay, I'm going to cover this a little bit more in depth a little bit later. Okay, now I need someone to read for us Psalm 122, verses 6 through 9. And then we're going to come back to one of these questions. Okay, Melissa, Psalm 122, verses 6 through 9. Okay, all right, go ahead, good. To me, this quote here sounds more like camp meeting. I think we have, the, I feel like we have more of that feeling of, of one. Okay, you have more of a feeling at camp meeting than you do here. Yeah. Okay. All right. I, I, I'll, I'll give you that too. Um, I've been invited to work in information again, and uh, they don't have, for those of you at haven't been to camp meeting that much, they had a trailer outside of the fitness center, which was information and transportation and stuff. 
Now they've moved all information inside the lobby of the uh, fitness center, and I love being in there. And Mike, you are not allowed to repeat this, but um, I would work even more hours than they give me because I get to see everybody. And uh, people that I haven't seen in years, uh, I will get to see again. So yes, I will do that. Mike, go ahead. I was thinking about your question, um, how we can make it more. Uh, I personally, uh, growing up and and many times I find myself in this situation where I'm a consumer when I come to church. And I think if we come to church with the mindset that we're supposed to be ministered to, um, we're going to have less of a worshipful experience than coming to worship God, to praise God, to be actively a part of worship and to participate. Um, it's easier um, for me uh, and because I find myself in the same <laughs> sense at times where with, you know, Allison, where you go, hey, we come here and it's, uh, it, it can tend to be that way unless I, um, I come for the intent to worship God instead of to be ministered to. I mean, there, there's a, there's a, there's a, and that, that wasn't meant towards you, you know that, right? So, um, but so from the perspective of if I, if I come here thinking everybody needs to minister to me, that's not the intent of coming to church. Um, now there's, there's an element of that, that we, we just gain that experience because we're here together, um, uh, sharing the goodness of God and worshiping him. And, and, and so those things happen naturally in that experience. But if that's my only intent to come, um, I miss out on the joy that I can experience by bringing to, to, uh, to church the things to worship the Lord. So, Okay, I want to hold on that. Uh, Joe, I'll come to you in a minute. I want to go to the next one because we're going to go in deeper to this subject that we're talking about here. So we need someone to read 122, Psalm 122, verses 6 through 9. Mm -hmm. 122, verses 6 through 9. Okay, we will wait. Don't worry. Yeah. Gave me time to. Right. Good. Okay, it says here pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they prosper who love you. Peace be within your walls, prosperity with your palaces for the sake of my brethren and companions. I will now say, Peace be within you because of the house of the Lord our God. I will seek your good. Okay, pray for peace. Basically, what would cause these travelers to pray for peace in Jerusalem? And then we have to ask the question, which goes along with some of what Mike and, and Allison and others have said, what peace in regard to our church or lives should we be praying for? And with that, I'm going to come to Joe because Joe wanted, had a comment that I think was probably related to this same thing that we're talking about here. Well, I was really going to dovetail on what Mike was saying. We have to, re as far as our experience in coming to church, uh, we have to remember, first of all, that God created us. We're, our very existence depends upon him. And if we understand our purpose, our purpose is to bring joy to him and to his heart. So if we, we come to church with the attitude and prayer, Lord, what can I do today to bring joy to your heart? Then we will come with the right attitude and, and the right experience, and hopefully we can say or do or experience something that will bring joy to his heart, and we will be blessed in return. I watched an interview yesterday afternoon on a news broadcast 
And it was a young journalist that had lost a leg in a, a Russian bombardment in Ukraine. And he was talking about his faith in God and how he wanted to tell people, you can go forward. And it was interesting to me that the man doing the interview clouded up and looked to me like he was ready for tears. We'll go to commercial now. You know, that kind of an experience can bring peace, can't it? As, as you listen to, the, to the, the story of somebody else. Um, last Sabbath, somebody said something that they learned a lesson from that they'll never do again was a DUI. And that person is bringing our sermon to us today. And if that doesn't get you and give you some sense of, of appraising for what God can do, then you'd better go have some prayer in a quiet place here. Are you with me on that? When, when you hear those kind of experiences. Now, what peace in regard to our church or lives should be, we be praying for? Now, I, I, I listed just one, just, just one area that I think brings peace. Contribute like this young man did to everyone. He says, everyone can do what I did if they rely on what God gives them to do. So I, I wrote down, contribute ideas and thoughts that would enhance worship. So all of us can bring our praises. Uh, we bring our requests, and, and I, can, I can appreciate uh, Pastor Lee because he stresses, I want to hear the praises. And if you come to prayer meeting, you know that that's something he does in prayer meeting too, is he wants to hear the praises as well as the request. So we can, we can bring our ideas that would enhance worship and do those. Earl, you're... It mentioned that in this same explosion that he lost his leg, there was two people who lost their lives. Yeah, and two people lost their lives in that. You must have watched that same interview there. Uh, anyway, um, the second part of this is just as important as the first part, and that's to be a team player. Now, what do I mean by being a team player? I have had the privilege of uh, teaching a class in the seminary, one, one little class. It didn't have enough interest to continue, and so it only did it once. Uh, but one of the things that I stressed to the young pastors, and I did do an intensive, um, Lauren Nelson had me come over for an intensive between semesters once, and I came up with about seven or ten things, earning the right to lead. And one of the things that I stressed to the young pastors was they need to be team players. In other words, I'm teaching a Sabbath school class here, right? The pastor, and I'm not the pastor, I'm a teacher. If the pastor is always out in the hallway talking, and always in the hallway meeting with people. Now, I know our pastors in these different divisions. Um, to be really blunt, he's not worried about the, me preaching particularly because I retired with full everything, so he knows I'm going to be the true Adventist. But he's, he's in these other places. But if you see a leader out there always talking on and not being a part of, what is that saying to my role? It's, my role isn't that important. Um, and we could take that a long, a long way. Be a team player as far as morally possible, even when my ideas are ignored. Are you, are you following? Even when I am disagreed with, I can still be a team player as long as it's not a moral issue. Even when it's a moral issue, 
I can still be present. I can still stand up for what's right. Are, are you with me on this? I can still be here. I want to give you a Bible example. At, all through the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah is talking about how they needed to yield to Babylon. You remember that? Those of you that have read that book, it's one of the harder books to read in the Bible for me anyway. Uh, as you read that book, you can see Jeremiah hammering away, go along with Babylon, go along with Babylon. God's going to bring us back in 70 years. You know, just do what you should do. King after king and person after person rebelled against Babylon. When we get to the end of the book, about three or four chapters before he gives his final, his final things, they decide they are going to go off to Babylon. Everybody that's left in Jerusalem that's of any name, they're all going to go to Egypt. And Jeremiah says, don't go to Egypt. Stay here and take your punishment. And the Bible says they took Jeremiah with them. He went with them. Even though it wasn't the thing to do, he went with them. If he, just, if he could have rebelled and been killed, so maybe you say he didn't really have a choice. Maybe he didn't. But he went with them, and we never hear any more about those people that went off to, Bab to Egypt. So even though we, we give our ideas, we give our praises, even if they're ignored, I'm still going to come. I'm still going to try to be a part. And I'm not going to force my thoughts and my ideas on everything. Um, one of the, my teachers in the seminary said, somebody said, well, can't we, play, can't we sing our favorite songs in, as a part of the sermon? And, and I'll never forget this. this. This professor said, you can choose your favorite song in the song service after you've been there six months. Okay, I just got a text or an email or something. I'm not going to do it anyway. Are you getting the point? We've got to be team players. We've got to work even when we're disagreed with. He's bringing a mic up here. Uh, Lisa. So uh, what do you think? Am I on track here? This is just one area where we could bring peace to the church. My mother taught me a long time ago as a small child that when you go to church, I go to church to hear the sermon because I figure the Lord has something to say every week to the pastor. I am... Um had the privilege of district superintendent. I told this before, but it really fits here with what you just said. I, uh, I went to, um, as a district soup, I was supposed to, on the fifth Sabbath, go visit other churches in my district. And I went to this one church where he had a lousy sermon. But the more I thought about it, I thought, boy, you know, his points were good. And I ended up rewriting the sermon because it turned out to be a good sermon because it impacted to me, even though I didn't agree with how he structured it, I, I still thought it was something good. I had a lady tell me, Pastor, I used to pray for you. When you came here, you couldn't preach yourself out of a wet paper bag. Nice. And that's almost word for word for what she said. She says, but the longer you were here, the better you got. Then I started praying for you. Uh, Lord, bless the lips of him who speaks. And she said, you got better. And then she said, I changed my prayer. Lord, bless the lips of him who speaks and the ears of those of us who hear. And she said, then your sermons came alive. Okay, Lisa. Okay. Yes. Uh, Mike said earlier, being consumers, but you were talking about being a team player, so instantly popped into my head a vision of like a basketball team, okay? And the ball is, you know, what you should do for God, let's say. You're not being much of a team player if you're throwing the ball and you just stand there. Okay, on the national stage, the Detroit Lions didn't have that many superstars but they played as a team, and look how far they went this year. 
you know, we have nothing, and those of us who like the Detroit Lions, we have nothing to be ashamed of with how far they went, but they played as a team. Mike? Yeah, and just to add to that point, you know, a little bit, expanding a little bit further, I didn't mean that um, we couldn't uh, enjoy the service or come to listen to the sermon or th those are all key points. I come to be fed as well. Um, but I really appreciated Joe's comment that if, if, uh, if that portion is not, how can I, how can I worship you? How can I praise you, God? How can I be in tune with you and what you'd have me to do today? I think that's, that's more the, the lines where we're thinking, okay, is it is it about me when I come here, or am I coming to worship, and am I coming to fellowship? It's it's really a wonderful experience to come together and and um, be together physically in this place, and uh, it's such a joy to have that experience. And when we when we can have the mindset that we're worshiping God and we're we're encouraging one another, and we are seeing where we can, uh, I love the fact that we do prayer requests and that they get sent out and we're lifting each other. It's, it's a big deal when I know that my church family is praying uh, for me, or I'm sure everyone here as well, that, hey, we're, we're here together to, to encourage, to grow together. I don't have to be leading up front to be a part of the team. I can be in the pews. I can be praying. I can be encouraging, having conversations. But if our mindset uh, is not on, I love my Lord, just like what um, Joe said it better, so I probably will butcher it. But if I'm here to worship you, and how can I worship you best today? That's really um, where we want to have our, our mindset at. I what I was saying before. Um, about taking the ball, and you were talking about how we can make it better. Um, there are needs in the church that um, it goes so much smoother when people accept helping in those needs, okay, and encouraging one another. And like Mike was saying, um, just to go along with that, um, a speaker up front is nothing to an empty church. <laughs> so, but we need, need to step forward for God in many, many different ways, you know, and be willing to be of service to him. And I think that blesses others and it makes the worship service better. Yeah. Okay, let's look at uh, Psalm 67. We're not going to get through, and, and I really wanted to look. I think this is kind of important. Uh, Psalm 67, verses 3 through 7, and I'll, I'll read that here from the NIV. Glorious things are, are said of you, city of God. I will record Rahab and Babylon among those who acknowledge me, Philistine too, and Tyre, and Cush, and say, basically, he, he's saying here, the, these are places that are going to be recognizing God. And so the question is, why would the Jews be interested in all nations to be a part of, the, of, the, of Zion? And um, we could spend a lot of time thinking about that, but I want to go on. Um, because the question at the end of Tuesday's lesson, it says this. So if you've got Tuesday's, go to Tuesday's section and look at that last little note there. It says... How does Zion's readiness to adopt all people find its fulfillment in the church's great commission to preach the gospel to every nation in Matthew 28, 19 through 20? How does this idea fit in with our call to preach the three angels' message? And I think this is a thought question that, again, goes along with what could we do to make things better? And should we be willing to preach the gospel all the way around here. Um, security. Um, if you are having a lot of problems, I suggest you spend some time reading Psalm 46, verses 1 through 11. And again, my time is up, and 
I must get on with other things that we could uh, um, we could go. But I do want to talk about this. Where do you go to find a place of Zion? I had a, a man named, uh, I went to a lecture, a two-day lecture, a conference sent us, um, Maxwell, the, the um, 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership. Mike, are you familiar with that? And one of the places he says for him is to get on top of a rock. And he says, when I'm on top of a big rock praying to my God, I, I just feel at peace there. And I have a big rock in my yard, but I don't climb on top of it to pray. But where is my place of Zion? And I kind of, kind of have to tell you that when I'm in my airplane up above by myself, is my place of Zion where I can talk to God. I'm, I'm a little closer, okay, uh, by at least a thousand feet or two. But how can we make, and we've already talked about this, how can we make our church a place of Zion? And we've already talked about that, and I think maybe that should be one of our prayer things. What do you think? That this should be something we should be praying about. How can we make our church a place of Zion let me change that. How can I make this church a place of Zion? Hmm. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this lesson and for these psalms. And I pray that you will bless us now as we go into the next part of the service. May your Holy Spirit be a part of everything that's done here today. I ask in Jesus' name. Thank you. I do too, but I didn't have time today. I didn't have time to...
Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Charlotte Seventh-day Adventist Church. It's good to have you all here with us today. Um, what a great blessing it is to be able to come together as children of God and to worship Him uh, together in this place. Also, welcome to those of you who are online. We're glad that you've uh, joined us today. Hope that we all gain a blessing as we worship our Lord together today. Uh, we're going to move forward with a um, with Cheryl Bernard for a minute. morning. Our mission moment this morning comes from the country of India. And as my husband, um, this was for his first mission trip was to India. And one of the things that he mentioned to me was, you know, when I got on the bus to travel, oftentimes there was a big, um, I don't know, like encased um, with a bunch of different, like a case at the front of the bus that had different gods in it. And it was so that they could worship different gods. Um, and one of them was Jesus. But um, there were many different gods, and they worship in India. And some, some people do in India. And you will see in this story today that that is the, um, the gentleman in this story grew up in a family where they had a room dedicated to many gods. And this is his story of what happened in his life when he learned about Jesus. Mission Report The Missing God Jarendra grew up in a city in India near the border with China, and his family worshipped several gods. They revered stones, statues, the sun, the moon, and this was common practice where he lived. One day, Jahendra saw a poster of Jesus in a store. He found it so beautiful that he decided to buy it. Jahendra didn't know much about Jesus, but he took the poster home to hang it alongside the other gods in his house. His family had a room for worship with all of these gods, and Jahendra fixed the image of Jesus to the wall. But when his mother saw it, she slapped her son's face and said, He is God, but not our kind of God. Undeterred, Jahendra hung the image on the outside of the room door. And the poster of Jesus remained there as the first God to be seen whenever anyone entered the worship room. Despite this, Jahendra didn't think much more about Jesus in his youth and only remembered him as an adult. During a period of unhappiness, he began reading the Bible, visiting various churches, and then he found the Seventh-day Adventist Church. He was moved by the sermon in the church and immediately requested baptism, but the pastor said he would have to study the Bible first. Convinced by the pastor's words, Jahendra dedicated himself to studying and was baptized after some time. Jahendra was ostracized by his family, but continues to be part of the church to this day. He claims to have chosen Jesus rationally, ensuring that his faith does not waver, even when faced with rejection. Part of this quarter's offering will support six schools and two churches in India. Let's give generously. All right, we're going to go through some announcements really quick. If you guys want to open up your bulletin and look at it with me, I'm only going to name a few of them because we have them going on our screen before and after service, so make sure to look at those. I'm just going to pinpoint a few of them that we have here. Um, one, just to remember our midweek study that we have here. Um, there's a lot of uh, great discussion and lots of good prayer time that happens there, so I encourage you to, uh, to look at going or zooming into that if possible. Um, also, we have a fellowship meal today afterwards over in our school that's behind the church here. So I hope you plan to stay and fellowship and uh, eat with us. Even if you didn't bring any food, there should be enough. So I hope you plan to stay by afterwards. Um, the rest I'm going to leave you to look at. Make sure you look at all of those. I'm going to have them um, in a second here play a video. 
I want to explain a little bit more about the books that we have out in our foyer and the, um, the mission trip that we've decided as a church to be a part of and helping uh, monetarily with it. And then I'm going to explain to you after this video is done, explaining the mission trip, um, how you can do your part to help with that. So if you guys could play that video now, that would be great. Did you know that of the 379 million people living in North America, only 1.2 million are Seventh-day Adventists? That's only 0.3% of the entire population. Over 2,000 years ago, Jesus instructed his followers to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Friends, we clearly have a lot of work to do, and we know that the night is coming when we will no longer be able to do the work that is set before us. So let us work while it is day. 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 People all around us are searching for purpose and hope. They are hungering for freedom and peace in the midst of chaos. And we have the answer. This upcoming April, we're calling on you to join the movement to experience personal revival and to dig deeper into the Word of God. We're calling on you to join a mission trip like none other as we come together to share the three angels' message with those who are hungering and thirsting for more. From April 14th to April 21st, GYC is partnering with both the Michigan Conference and Streams of Light International to host a seven-day mission trip in Lansing, Michigan. In this mission trip, our goal is to place one great controversy into every single home of Lansing. Jesus outlined our mission over 2,000 years ago. Are you ready? Visit GYCweb.org today to register to join us as we deliver God's message of love to a world that desperately needs it. Friends, we have a work to do. So let us work while it is day. All right, so that video is a promotional that they uh, put out to try to get people to join the mission trip that they're doing in Lansing that's coming up here. As I said before, we, we as a church have um, become a part of uh, sponsoring this mission trip, and as part of that, they're actually going to be passing out 3,000 of those books right here in, our, right here in Charlotte. So, oh, amen, that's right. So we actually have 2,700 of those books already in our lobby right now. So normally on a day like today, we like to do some outreach, but being that um, the pastor and me won't be available to help lead it, we're going, I'm going to ask you to do something different, and in a couple weeks from now, we'll actually do a joint outreach together to get these books packed for that mission trip. Um, so right now, I just want to ask that if you're, uh, if you're able to do it, that you take a box or two home with you to be able to pack it, and you can see me afterwards about that. Um, because there's a specific way that we pack these. With There's a bookmarker that goes in the book. There's a Thrive book that goes on the back. And they have to be put in a certain way and everything like that. So I won't go into all the details now like I was going to. But if you're willing to take a box or two home afterwards and want to bring it back with you, that would be really helpful. We're going to have the school kids help pack these. And like I said, we're going to do a big joint um, church packing um, of them at a later time as well. So I hope that you're encouraged that you know, God's word is going to be given out to our town. And uh, hopefully you'll take part in helping us do our share. And if you want to help them pass them out too, that's always something that is a possibility as well. So I don't see my wife here, but we're going to move forward with our praise music at this time.
I love worshiping with you. So nice to sing praises to our Jesus together. And, oh, it's such a nice Sabbath day. So thankful for a church family who just gets in there. Kaven's crying right now, and Mrs. Bernard is in helping. And I'm just so thankful that this is not just a church. We're a family. And I'm just so thankful for you. So thankful for Jesus. Let's sing Amazing Grace. My chains are gone. You can stand with us and sing. Jesus did for us at the cross.
so thankful that Jesus is good all the time. And even in the moments that I don't understand, he's still good. And I'm so thankful that we serve a God that's good. And that he's not wanting evil for us. But he really wants good for us, and he's willing to give that to us. I'm so thankful for that. I love you, Lord. Lord, well, your mercy never fails me. All my days, I've been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, I will sing of the goodness of
Spirit of the Living God. Father in heaven, we do believe that is the prayer of our hearts here. We're asking for your Holy Spirit to be in our hearts and in our minds. Lord, we just ask for a blessing today, and that you bless our speaker, that her lips are anointed, and that we know we heard from you through her today. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to worship you, and we pray that be honorable in your sight. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Uh, sing our opening hymn. The opening hymn is number 670, oh, no, that's Spirit of Living God, 483, I Need Thee Every Hour.
Happy Sabbath. I'll be reading John 11, 41, 42. You can say amen when you get there. Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead man was lying, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me, and I know that you always hear me, but because of the people who are standing by, I said this, that they may believe that you sent me. Amen. It's now time for <laughs> our <laughs> offering and tithe. So uh, today it's for the local church budget, which is for all of the different ministries that our church has. And so may the deacons please come forward. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much that it's your Sabbath. Thank you for another day of life. Please be with us as we worship you. Um, please bless the offering that is about to be given. Uh, please bless it and multiply it in your name. Amen. Amen. Beautiful music. Now is the time we're going to uh, share the slips that have been turned in for our family uh, praise and prayer time. Um, this is a great thing that we do here. Um, I know if you're on our email list, you can get these, so that you can print it out and have it during the week to be able to cover not only the ones that we speak about right here, but the ones that they cover in adult Sabbath school too, I believe. So it's, it's a great blessing to get those emails and be able to remember uh, your church family and friends throughout the uh, the entire week. I'm going to share with you the ones that have been turned in uh, so far. This one just says for Emily Gibbs and Tiffany Nelson for health concerns. So let's make sure to keep Emily Gibbs. I know her situation, not as much Tiffany Nelson, but let's keep those two names in our prayers as they're dealing with um, definite health concerns. Also one here for the Henning family. Make sure to keep them um, in your prayers as well. Uh, this one is from Melissa. She says that I am well enough to be back at church. I can say amen to that. It's good to have you back at church. I know uh, we all have been praying a lot for you, and um, it's just good to see you back here. And then uh, also praise for the prayers of my church family. So, 
Um, and one uh, prayer request for the continued healing and for wisdom for the doctors. Most definitely pray for the doctors as they uh, have an important job to uh, try to figure out a lot of the mysteries of the, the human body and earth that we have. Um, this is from Jan Ritten. I can uh, second this one. She praises uh, God for the sunshine today. Yeah. We haven't had a really bad winter this year. We've had a few warm days, but it is very nice when you get the sunshine to be able to uh, praise God for the, the beautiful things that he's made along with the sunshine. And she has a prayer request for her cousin, Vanessa, who is missing in the Lansing area. So prayers for her safe return. So cousin Vanessa, who's missing in the Lansing area. Please keep that in your prayers. I know that um, that can be hard times for a lot of people. So keep Vanessa especially in your prayers that she is found safely. Um, from Kelly Brophy, she's uh, praising God for his love. I think we can all be happy for that. Prayer request, she has an unspoken one. And then for Jamie, a young lady who needs help and prayers for a situation that she's in. Make sure to keep Jamie in your prayers as well. And then I have the blank slip, which is an important one. It's, uh, sometimes there's some things that are difficult for us to talk about and to say in front of our family and friends, but it's pretty easy to say that to God, and that's what this blank one represents, is our silent request that we have. Um, does everyone have a silent request or something? Yeah. Yes. Okay. For the for everyone streaming and didn't hear that, um, Mindy Rolle's daughter Jenna uh, just called. She was on her way to church, and she's not going to be here now because um, Evelyn is in the emergency room. So make sure to keep Evelyn in your prayers. Um, that everything's okay there. All right, um, I'm going to kneel here, and please, if, you're, if you can kneel, kneel as far as possible before the Lord as we bring these praises and requests before him today. Heavenly Father, what a privilege it is to come before your throne today and to bring you honor and glory and to worship before you. Lord, we just thank you for the opportunity that we have as your people to be able to share the good news about you. And even as sinful people that we can still approach your throne and that our requests can be heard through you and our praises as well, Lord. Lord, we're so grateful for many things today. We're so grateful for the beautiful sunshine out. And we're so happy to have Melissa back um, with our family here. Lord, there's so many things that we can uh, continue on to be grateful for. And we just uh, thank you that even in a, a hard world, in a place that can be tough at times, that you, you can add the little uh, silver lining or glimmer of something that's beautiful and, and uh, bring a smile to our faces. Lord, we have many requests up here. Lord, you heard me bring them up before the congregation. And Lord, you knew them before they were even written down or spoken. Lord, I ask that you act in each of these situations in a very personal and intricate way, Lord. And that your will be done within them. And that your will can be done not only for, for maybe the good of people, but for your name to be glorified and honored through it all. Lord, we pray for um, our speaker today. Lord, I know it can be hard to be up front and to talk in front of people, and I just pray that you can calm her nerves and be with her, and that you also anoint her lips so that we know that we're, we're hearing from your throne above, Lord, um, through her. 
we just thank you for being a God who is willing to use us and to uh, allow us to be used to bless others. I pray that you uh, put, put, um, put outreach on our hearts as we know that in the Great Commission, that's the one thing that can help bring, up our, uh, bring about your uh, second coming sooner. Lord, help us to do your work so that we can see you face to face that much sooner. Lord, we just thank you for the opportunity to be here. And we just pray this all in Jesus' holy name. Amen. For our children's story, now that's loud. Uh, um, the kids will walk around and they uh, collect dollars or some money from people, and that all goes for a fund to help people attend our church, local church school here. So if they're walking around collecting dollars, that's what it goes for. Well, good morning, children. It's so good to see you here today. I've got a story for you. Imagine being hungry. Can you all imagine being hungry? Yeah. <laughs> so you know what I'm talking about. 300 kids were gathered around the dining room table. And there was only one problem. There was absolutely no food. So hungry. They had lived a life where they were hungry most days before they were at this place. And they were looking forward to breakfast. There was a man by the name of George who was called to a missionary in this place. He was called by God to set up an orphanage. So this was took place at an orphanage. And uh, he had decided early on, or was called to early on, always ask God to supply all the needs. And God was so abundantly in supplying his needs in life, he was able to build this huge orphanage. They had over 1,000 kids, really, but there were 300 this morning. And so he always had built up his faith and trust in God that all the needs would be supplied. So here are the children around the table. And um, he had a friend's little girl with him named Abigail. He said, Abigail, you know, they had come to him and said, we have no food. The cook said, we don't have any food. I don't know what to do. He said, Abigail, come with me. I'm going to show you how God works. So he went to the dining room, and he said to the kids, he goes, take your places, sit down. So they all took their places. And mind you, there's nothing there. Take your places, food. You know, the plates are empty, you know. And then he prayed a very simple prayer. 
something to the effect of, God, you know what we need. Please supply it. We thank you for everything. And he just left. And he said, yeah, we got to watch what God will do. And there was a knock at the door. I don't know if it makes sound. And pretty soon there was the town baker at the door. And he said, I was impressed to get up extra early this morning to bake fresh bread just for you. And he had boxes and boxes of bread that he had got up early to bake. And somehow God had impressed him to do that, and he delivered that. And it was wonderful. All the children. Imagine 300. Makes me think of the Jesus story, feeding the 5,000, right? 300 children had enough bread to eat. But that wasn't all. There was another knock at the door. <laughs> this time it was a milkman. Thank you. <laughs> it was a milkman. His cart wheel had broken, and he had to take all the milk off the cart in order to fix his cart. And he asked, he asked George, do you, do you, can you use it? Can you use the milk? <laughs> and of course he took him up on it, and they had enough milk for all the kids to have a mug of milk that morning. And it really made an impression on Abigail. Now, I'm here to say that God can do the same thing for you guys. You know, you have to talk to him. That's all it takes. Talking to God just like he's a friend, telling him what you need, telling him what you're worried about, telling him all the things in your life, your joys too, don't forget that. So that's what I want you guys to know. Let's have a short prayer then. Father, thank you so much for each individual here, each kid, child, and help them to know in their heart that they can turn to you always. I pray in Jesus' name. <laughs> you can go back to your seats. Letting go of every single dream, I lay each one down at your feet. Every moment of my wandering never changes what you see. I've tried to win this war, I confess. My hands are weary, I need your rest. Mighty warrior king. <laughs> Let's start over, sorry. <laughs> Letting go of every single dream, I lay each one down at your feet. Every moment of my wandering never changes what you see. I've tried to win this war, I confess. My hands are weary, I need your rest. Mighty warrior, king of the f fight. No matter what I face, you're by my side. When you don't move the mountains, I'm needing you to move. When you don't part the waters, I wish I could walk through. 
through when you don't give the answers as i cry out to you i will trust i will trust i will trust in you truth is you know what tomorrow brings there's not a day ahead you have not seen so in all things be my life and breath i want what you want lord and nothing less when you don't move the mountains i'm needing you to move when you I wish I could walk through when you don't give the answers as I cry out to you I will trust I will trust I will trust in you Ooh, I will trust in you you are my strength and comfort you are my steady hand you are my firm foundation the rock on which i stand your ways are always higher your plans are always good there's not a place where i'll go you've not already stood when you don't move the mountains i'm needing you to move when you don't part the waters i wish i could walk through when you don't give the answers as i cry out to you i will trust i will trust i will trust in you Ooh, i will trust in you I will trust in you. Good morning. I wanted to start out by welcoming my church family. It's good to see some of you in church today that haven't been able to in the past, so I'm, I'm thankful for that. I also want to welcome any visitors, and if you're watching on live stream, which probably the live stream makes me more nervous than anything. I'm so happy you have all joined us today. Something I have come to know about our Pastor Lee, and he's supposed to be watching today. He has the gift of persuasion as evidence of me standing here right now. Hi, Pastor Lee. We love you. <laughs> okay. So continuing on the subject matter from the book of Steps to Christ, my subject today is on prayer. So if you'll join me, we'll bow our heads right now. Father, thank you for my breath, and the ability to speak. Thank you for the inspiration you've given me. The courage to come up here and talk. May we all have an open heart to listen to what your word has to say today. The title is Two Prayers, One God for today. The young mother had been going through rough times lately. She was a fairly new Christian and was still developing her faith. And now 
this agonizing decision was placed on her and her husband's lap. If their beautiful baby girl didn't get heart surgery, she would likely not live to be 30 years old. But if she had surgery now, there was a chance she could die on the operating table. The decision was up to them. How do you make such a decision? One thing they knew for certain was that prayer was a lifeline to God that they must have. So the decision was made for surgery. However, one of the all-consuming thoughts was that the surgeon needed to pray with them. It was important that he was a believer and would pray to God to be with him for the surgery. How would they find out if he would? Now I'm going to switch to another story. Trouble had been building for years in this young couple's life. Lately, it had become nonstop. Loss of family, growing family, health challenges, caregiving responsibilities, loss of income, new jobs. The pressures were at a boiling point for the young wife. Most of her stress centered around caring for her mother-in-law who had dementia. If only God would heal her mother-in-law. So she prayed, and she prayed with every ounce of faith and was sure God would answer. After all, she had read and heard about a miraculous healing if you would just believe. It only takes the faith of a mustard seed, right? Two different prayers to the same God of heaven. I'll come back to these stories later. But just know that these two prayers had very different outcomes. didn't quite go through my pictures, so there we go. Okay. Personally, I have always struggled with prayer. Growing up in a secular home where prayers were not a way of life, I didn't know how to pray. Who do you pray to? I mean, when you grow up and you know nothing about it, when do you pray? Does God hear all prayers? What do you say to God? The questions are endless. The subject of prayer could take days. Y'all want to stay here? However, I am only going to focus on the question, what is the purpose of prayer and how are we to handle or react to the outcomes of our prayers? By the way, Fallon, you still out there, Joel, that song was absolutely perfect to what I'm talking about today. I, that was unbelievable. Very nice. There are really there are really two outcomes or answers to prayer. Yes or no. Now I know some people would argue there is maybe there's a maybe or there's a later, but I'm really talking about the outcome in the short term. The no could be complete silence. I would throw in the yes category those prayers that get a positive answer right away, just as you imagined or better. For instance, you need a new car, and voila, the next day somebody gives you a new car. <laughs> in the no category are those prayers where God is silent or seemingly oblivious, like in Fallon's song. I heard it all through the words. For example, you pray for healing and it never happens. You may never see an answer to this prayer in your lifetime on this earth. Silence. Why the different outcomes? What is the purpose of prayer anyway? I mean, God is all-powerful. Ellen White, in the book Steps to Christ, puts it this way. She puts it couple ways, but he rules over all the affairs of the universe. Nothing that in any way concerns our peace is too small for him to notice. Hmm. She also gives us advice on the screen. Prayer is the opening of the heart to God 
as to a friend. I can't think of a better place to look for answers than the Bible. So let's explore some yes prayers in the Bible. In the Old Testament, Hannah had an agonizing prayer. It's found in 1 Samuel 1, 10 through 13, on the screen. In her deep anguish, Hannah prayed to the Lord, weeping bitterly. And she made a vow, saying, Lord Almighty, if you will only look on your servant's misery and remember me and not forget your servant, but give her a son, then I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life, and no razor will ever be used on his head. And as she kept on praying to the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was praying in her heart, and her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. Eli thought she was drunk. Now imagine being in such pain of soul, pouring your heart out to the Lord that you appear drunk. Put yourself in her place. As we know, God heard her prayer and answered in the affirmative. Granted, you should note this was a persevering prayer. Samuel was born and became a blessing to many. What about the ultimate example of a prayer, prayer warrior? Jesus. Let's look at one of his examples. In the story of feeding the 5,000, Jesus prayed, and that prayer was fulfilled right then, abundantly, a yes prayer. Or how about his prayer to awaken Lazarus from the tomb? Found in our scripture verse, John 11, 41 and 42. You can read it. Father, I thank you that you have heard me, and I know that you always hear me. But because of the people who are standing by, I said this, that they may believe you sent me. What an example. What an outcome. <clears throat> However, <laughs> looking on the flip side, the Bible also has many examples of prayers that seem unanswered. You know, the no, the silence prayers. Going back to the Lazarus story, I'm sure while he was sick, Mary and Martha, his sisters, were praying for his healing. Put yourself in their shoes. God has the power to heal, and yet Lazarus, the brother, died. Of course, we know Jesus later raised him from the dead. But, and here's the key point, for a while the prayer seemed to fall on nothing. Yet later we find the solid faith of Martha. And going back to Jesus' prayers, did he have prayers that were answered no? Did he ever feel as if God did not hear his prayers? This was eye-opening to me. Let's read Matthew 26, 39. Oops. There we go. <clears throat> he went on a little farther and bowed with his face to the ground, praying, My Father, if it is possible... Let this cup of suffering be taken away from me. Yet, I want your will to be done, not mine. We can also look at Matthew 27, 46, which I don't have on the screen. We turn to that one. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out. He 
cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. Probably. Sorry. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Wow. So what are we to make of these seemingly opposite outcomes to prayers? The yes prayers are easy. We rejoice. But the no prayers, uh, it comes down to trust. The purposes of prayer is more for us than for God. I mean, God is all. He can supply our wants and needs without our prayers. Could you imagine? Could you imagine trying to manage millions of prayers in a day? It's a simple example. But let's say one person rightly prays that they want rain for their crops to grow, while another person rightly prays that they want sunshine so they can take a walk with their neighbor to tell, tell them about God. Hmm. Computers can manage analyzing vast amounts of information, but can anything compare to the ministry of managing all prayers so that each person is given the best outcome for eternity? Trust. Ellen White put it much more elo eloquently than I could, found in chapter 11. I'm going to read this to you. The assurance is broad and unlimited, and he is faithful who has promised. When we do not receive the very things we ask for at the time we ask, we are still to believe that the Lord hears and that he will answer our prayers. We are so erring and short-sighted that we sometimes ask for things that would not be a blessing to us. And our Heavenly Father in love answers our prayers by giving us that which will be for our highest good, that which we ourselves would desire. If the vision divinely enlightened, we could see all things as they really are. When our prayers seem not to be answered, we are to cling to the promise. For the time of answering will surely come, and we shall receive the blessing we need most. But to claim that prayer will always be answered in the very way and for the particular thing that we desire is presumption. I couldn't put it better. <clears throat> now back to my stories. And let me share details. Because these stories were very personal prayers and they shaped the faith and trust in God I have today. Those are stories were about me. I did ask permission of my family to put pictures up. So. <laughs> my daughter, Lydia, was born with a heart defect called a VSD. And when she was just 15 months old, Eric and I made the decision to give her a chance to have a full life. I was in utter pain of soul until the moment they wheeled her away to surgery, because then she was fully in God's hands. I had no more control. I had to find these and dig them out, but I, um, if you'll allow me, I will read you something from the journal during that time. I am a journaler, and I keep journals. It is the night before Lydia's heart surgery. I feel scared. I know this matter is out of my hands. I have no power, only God does. And I've placed Lydia in his hands. I feel as though I have been holding my breath since we decided on surgery. And now with each passing moment, my airway seemed to be constricting more and more. I feel lonely somehow. Wish I could talk to someone who has been through this already. Also feel sad that we are separated from Jedediah and hope he doesn't feel abandoned. 
Lydia looks and acts so vibrant and healthy that it is very hard for me to consent to surgery that will lay her up for a while. But I know the needs But I know this needs to be for better health as she grows. Signing off and praying to God for protection on our little girl. It was an agonizing time. We did somehow manage to find out if the surgeon was a praying man. And the prayer he had with us before surgery was a comfort beyond measure. Keep this in mind when you have a chance to pray with someone. And the outcome of this prayer, I'll call this my yes prayer. Our beautiful daughter has been a blessing. And you can say hi to her today if you see her. Yes, this was one of my yes prayers. Going back to the other story I shared with you. No, just to... Uh, you can see her as an adult in person, but she was a cute little thing. <clears throat> the second story is also mine. Eric and I were in a tough situation. Terrible troubles had descended upon us unseeming, seemingly all at once. His father had passed away, leaving his mother who had severe Alzheimer's. She needed care. Then I had Lydia, and I had to have gallbladder surgery afterwards, in which I had complications. During this time, my mother-in-law, Marlene, was moved to our place for care. Two young children and a childlike adult to care for. To say the least, it was stressful. But there was more. Lydia had heart surgery in May of 1998, and Eric lost his job. I took on a part-time job to help make ends meet. Marlene, my mother-in-law, often got on my nerves, on my last nerve with her yelling and our other actions. I knew that she had been a dedicated disciple of God, and I really didn't see any point in her illness. I was also a fairly new Christian. I'd only been a Christian a couple years at this time. So with the faith of a fairly new Christian, I prayed for her healing. I really, really believed God would answer that prayer with a yes. My faith became shattered when God was silent. I became very bitter towards my mother-in-law and my husband, and I blamed God. I have another passage in my, of this time in my journal, and I hope you'll forgive me for uh, reading something that is so raw and maybe hard to hear. I love my family, but hate taking care of Marlene. She's not Eric's mom anymore. She is just a grumpy old lady who doesn't know who we are. I hate washing the poop off her every day and listening to her negative comments all the time. It gets me down. Seems like Eric doesn't understand. He thinks his mom is easy to care for. She is physically, but not mentally. I never felt this way before she came to live with us. So I have to believe this is putting a strain on our life. And I can't talk to Eric about it because he just gets angry sometimes. Thank God for my journal. It is It is a a release of my frustration. I pray the Lord to the Lord to just take this problem away. I know maybe God is trying to shape my character 
but it is not working. I'm just turning into this nasty B word, I put, and putting too much pressure on Eric. I secretly wish Marlene would just die and feel guilty about that. That is not at all how Jesus would feel. What a horrible disease Alzheimer's is. I would w- wouldn't wish it on anyone. I need God to change me somehow. I don't have the answers. Just know I don't want to go on like this. Forgive me, God, for being mean to my family and for wishing Marlene were dead. But I'm also angry with you. God, you promised no problem would be more than we could handle, and I'm being pushed over the edge. Please help. I'm telling you these stories so that I bring inspiration that whatever you're struggling with, you're not alone. It became so overwhelming that one night I drove away thinking of suicide. It was the only way out I could envision. You see, the problems were, I want to stress this, the problems were more than I could handle, despite what some people claim. I ended up in a carpool area, (laughs) and then I lost it with God. I screamed and screamed at him in anger and cried until I was physically spent. It was then that he spoke to me. in the form of a Signs of the Times magazine that was laying on the passenger car seat. I don't remember the article. But in that moment, I realized I I had been hanging on to the entire burden. So I literally handed all my troubles to God. I made the motion and everything. (laughs) Oh, what a relief that was. I was instantly, and I mean instantly, at peace. Only God knows the full reason why he did not heal my mother-in-law. But he did heal me. Later I found this picture. Of Marlene when she was a four-year-old girl. And looking at it, I realized. She had a mother that loved her dearly and only wished the best for her future, just like I wished for my daughter. When care became hard, I would look at this picture. I was able to care for her without resentment, and eventually God worked out everything for the best. He changed me. Incidentally, I now care for older people that have problems like this, and I do it with joy. God truly changed me. Two prayers, but there is one God, and he knows what he's doing. Listen to this prayer once again. Father, I thank you that you have heard me, and I know that you always hear me. Prayer is for us to commune with God, telling him all as we would a friend. Trust. Thank you all for listening to me and my nervousness. Um... I'm not sure the order now, Chris. A closing prayer or the hymn? Oh, the hymn. Number 524. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus.
great. Father, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for the lessons that we learn in life. Thank you for being there with us. Most of all, thank you for hearing our prayers. Thank you for Jesus. His death on the cross and the sacrifice he made for us and the love he shows us. I ask that you be with each one of us as we go throughout our week. And any burdens that we have that can be brought to mind to bring them to you fully, not trying to hang or cling to them, but to fully give our burdens to you. In Jesus' name.